So this is the first lecture, and uh, um, during first lecture, I wanted to focus on uh, supersymmetry. Since my uh, lectures will be dedicated to relation between supersymmetry and integrability, uh, I have to review both parts. So today, I will be mostly doing supersymmetry. And next lecture, I will be probably mostly doing integrability. But there will be some integrability today also. And the next lecture will be some supersymmetry. So I want to start with um, supersymmetric theories with uh, four supercharges. And I want to think about th these theories in, um, in two dimensions, in one plus one dimension, are called um, n equals 2 theories. Um, I want to think, uh, for, for a starting, I want to think about two-dimensional space to be a cylinder. So this is a circle, and this will be time direction. Uh, but later, later, there will be lots of discussion when this is arbitrary, arbitrary image surface with the genus G and N punctures. And later, even I will later, there will be three dimensional, four dimensional, five dimensional, and maybe even maybe even six dimensional theories, about which I will think as two dimensional theories with um, infinitely many fields. Let me um, already here uh, say a few words about uh, what I mean by this. Uh, and for mo most of you, yeah, I actually designed these lectures to be very elementary. But I think that there are things that I will be discussing that I'm not expert myself. But I still m try to make it elementary. Um, so way you think about this is l like, if you are in three dimensions, uh, you can think about three-dimensional space to be uh, this cylinder that I drawn here times a circle of some radius r. And uh, uh, that three-dimensional theory viewed in terms of the theory on, on, on this one <coughs> will have infinitely many fields, which are usually called Kaluza-Klein modes. And they will be massive. And masses will be proportional to kaluza klein mode divided by radius. If you are in four dimensions, you can again think about four dimensional theories as times two torus. And again, kaluza klein modes will give you infinitely many fields in this two dimensional theory on, on a cylinder. But there is an alternative. way uh, of thinking about the uh, uh, higher dimensional theories to be lower dimensional. And this is the, uh, achieved by omega background. And only thing we will need from here, since I assume that the, we are familiar with kaluza klein theories, is that uh, the idea of kaluza klein theories, the circle, is related to the fact that we consider um, identification of the space coordinates along, let's take this R1, which we will make as well. We identify coordinate here, let's suppose to be x. We identify x and x plus r. And this is a shift. So we are using the transformation from translation group. And that leads us to, uh, uh, to compactification on a circle. And omega background, only thing actually we have to think about this, that instead of such identification, we take R2, let's say, in the higher dimension, instead of T2, we take R2, and we use the rotation with angle, which we call epsilon. So this kind of thing I will call, instead of Kaluza-Klein, R2 epsilon. And it's actually a simple thing to see that the 
uh, from the point of two-dimensional theory when we replace T2 by, uh, by omega background with this, uh, this thing, uh, this will be again the theory with infinitely many fields and masses will be related to the modes of the expansion in spherical function. So uh, that's what I said here is that the we are studying now four supercharges in two dimensions but the theory is not necessary, are not necessarily two dimensional. They can be Kaluza Klein from three dimension, four dimension, actually five dimension, or omega backgrounds coming from four dimension. This requires two space real dimension as minimum one. So we can think about omega backgrounds coming from four dimensions or six dimensions if we have two angles like epsilon. So this is a setup, and now I want to say a few words about the algebra of su for supercharges. <coughs> So first statement is that space of vacua, and I need to explain this, which means supersymmetric vacua, in theories with um, four supercharges, carries a representation of a commutative associative algebra, which is called, and we will be using uh, that uh, all the time, this algebra is called uh, twisted chiral ring. So this is something that we're first interested in. Let me introduce this object. In order to introduce it, we have to remember that four supercharges means that we have, let's, let's label them, Q plus, Q minus, Q plus bar, and Q minus bar. This is just notation of four charges, and the, we need only non-trivial anti-commutation commutation relation is Q plus minus anti-commutator with Q plus minus bar is two times Hamiltonian plus minus momentum. So this is superalgebra, rest of this stuff is trivial. And uh, uh, if we want to write Hamiltonian, if we want to cancel this plus minus translation, we can introduce two linear combinations, two independent linear combinations. The other ones will be related if we want to make with some coefficients. Uh, QA will be denoted by Q plus plus Q minus bar, and QB is Q plus plus Q minus. So with this notation, you can check that Hamiltonian, yes, and the QA square equals zero and QB square equals zero as a consequence of supersymmetric algebra. And you can check that Hamiltonian is harmonic in both. So we can write it as a QA, uh, QA bar or QB, QB bar. And I use just the word harmonic in quotation mark uh, comparing the uh, Laplace being d d dagger plus d dagger d and d squares to zero. So it's just just for analogy. So this is Hamiltonian and um, now the power of this supersymmetry with four supercharges is, uh, um, by the way, all these things I'm talking about goes back to Wheaton in late 80s and uh, very well used and described by Chakoti and Waffa also in early 90s. Uh, the Witten is probably late 80s and the Chakoti Waffa in early 90s. So there is a statement that A, if Psi, so question we are asking is, uh, uh, since Q squares to zero, what is the cohomology of Q? So I will pick one of them, let's pick QA, and we now just denote it by Q. So question is, what are cohomology classes of Q? A, a or B, does not matter, so I picked A. So first statement again is that suppose Psi is such class, such a class. which means that the psi is a state in our quantum system, which is having the symmetry, the any, any, any theory, 
such that cube psi equals zero, and psi is not q of something. So if psi is an eigenfunction of Hamiltonian with non-zero eigenvalue or linear combination of those, and lambda is not equal to zero, it's trivial to show that psi is actually is trivial in cohomology. And the way you show it, you just write h psi as q q dagger plus q dagger q of psi, which is um, because we are talking about psi that is killed by q, so this term is 0. So it's q of q dagger psi, because this term is 0. And we got a statement that the, we can write psi as q of 1 over lambda q dagger psi, which means that it's a q exact and it's trivial in cohomology. So for psi's that span the non-zero uh, non, uh, eigenfunctions uh, of um, non-zero eigenvalues of Hamiltonian, this is trivial in cohomology. So the only non-trivial cohomology classes are corresponding to lambda equals 0. So we are now discussing, we are just saying that the uh, vacua, which preserves supersymmetry, supersymmetric vacua, uh, are maybe uh, uh, giving cohomology classes of Q. So let's test this statement. So we assume now that h of psi equals 0. So now let's multiply it left by psi and calculate the norm. This is a place where I'm using the norm. Normally, uh, in this discussion, you don't have to use the norm, but the, to prove the statement, I have to use the norm. So I assume that in Hilbert space of the vacuum, there is a scalar product. So this, from the definition of H, is nothing more but absolute value square of Q psi moduli square plus Q dagger psi moduli square, because h is a Laplace kind of operator. And this is equal to 0, from which I conclude, assuming that the norm is uh, non-degenerate, that q psi equals 0 and q dagger psi equals 0. So which is t stating that the psi, which is a vacua, are harmonic representatives of Kuka homology. Now, there is one more thing you have to do to prove that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between supersymmetric vacua and um, cohomology, is that if you assume, assume that psi is trivial, so it's q of alpha. You have to did end psi is an eigenfunction of Hamiltonian with zero eigenvalue. You have to deduce that the psi is trivial, or it's actually zero. The simple calculation shows uh, that h psi is q of h alpha and is equal to 0. So if h alpha is not 0, you conclude that alpha is q of something, which implies psi is 0. The very simple proof. Now, if you assume h alpha is 0,
it implies that q on alpha equals 0, from which it follows again psi equals 0. So what I just e explained is that the, uh, there is really one-to-one -one correspondence between Q cohomologies and the vacua. And if we want to count supersymmetric vacua, equivalently, we can ask the question uh, to describe cohomology classes of Q. So this statement was independent of choice of the scalar product, except the proving that it's a harmonic representative. Uh, so now another thing I want to use, go from states to operators. Suppose OI is in Q cohomology as an operator which means that the Q with OI equals 0 up to the shift of OI plus delta of some phi. Then important thing, and this is what I stated over there, um, that space of vacua is a representation of commutative associative algebra is that if O is on cohomology, then OI times OJ, and this index I uh, takes value somewhere. Now we will actually, we are studying where it takes the value. So OI, OJ also will commute with Q. It's a trivial calculation. So we can write that the, uh, now let me put x here and the y, they can be in any position when x and the y are coordinates here. And we forget uh, this x and so on, to not to mix with that thing. Uh, well, the other thing, the important one, is that the OI as a function of x actually is independent of x in Q cohomology. And this is consequent to the fact that if I take and shift x by delta x, so if I move the point, then this will be OI of, of x plus Q of something. And the reason it's Q of something is because shift operator, which is um, P, can be written as a Q of something from these formulas. So since x plus delta x is the same here as if I would, so this thing is the same as OI of x plus delta x times P acting on OI of x, P times O is Q exact. It means that the OI of x is independent of position. This allows to take this formula for Q commutator with O's and conclude that OI, as now I drop the dependence on point, times OJ can be written in terms of the some other O's which also have the properties that they commute with Q. So now these indices run in the space of all operators which commute with Q plus Q of something. And this statement is the one that I wrote in that side of Blackboard. Moreover, uh, it's symmetric in I replacement by J and this is because we are in because we are in two dimensions or higher. This will not be true in one dimension. Because ordering in two dimensions and higher makes no meaning since uh, anywhere I put here x and y, which I said is independent, I can now make x to move around y anywhere. And I can't say what is the order. Because dependence on position of this guy, whether it's first or the second, 
is, is a dependence on x. And this one I already proved that is uh, uh, trivial, uh, q exact. And since I'm living in q exact uh, relations, then this guy is symmetric in ij. So we have now symmetric metric Cijk, uh, where indices i, j, k, and everything I will be using belong to, uh, they are labeled by the, uh, by the vacuum. Let me explain this last statement, and we can move on something interesting. Uh, suppose we found such one operator, OI. Then it's obvious, uh, or let's say it differently. Suppose we found one vacua, which is supersymmetric. Let's call it O. Then we have to discuss the uniqueness of this one state that we take. On, on this part, actually, I advise to read the old paper of Chekhozzi and Waffa from 1992. Uh, suppose we find one state, special state, in space of vacuum. This is defined as all psi is annihilated by 0, or equivalently, q psi equals 0, divide by uh, psi identified with psi plus q of alpha. Suppose we find such one state. And now we have the operator oi which commits with q. We form another state, which is oi acting on 0. Obviously, this also be belongs to vacuum because q will annihilate the i since q anti-commutes with O. So now we found as many vacuum states as we have operators O. So there is a statement that there is an operator state correspondent which we will be using. Uh, there are some subtleties which might be related to the structure of this constant Cijk, but when I will move to topological field theories, I will discuss those subtleties. But in a generic situation, there is complete operator state correspondence. And as I said, the proving it is trivial. Uh, and now we ask two type of questions. First type of question would be, but uh, you don't show uh, that it's actually a spaceful neither it's reducible. You neither show a spaceful neither irreducible. What do you mean? It's a reducible representation of the commutative ring? Or? Yeah, is it reducible or irreducible? Okay, the well, first thing we show is that if there is operator O, there is a state, which is a zero eigenstate of Hamiltonian. Now we will study structure of the vacuum state, all of the states. So this is the next step. So we, first we think we need it was this operator state correspondence, and it sometimes fails, but we are in generic situation. Now we are discussing what kind of structures this space has. So there are two important uh, things. First, we know that it's a representation of the commutative ring. What kind of representation is, we, we will be discussing entire, and during the entire thing. Uh, this ring, by the way, let me give it a name, if I did not give. This ring is called twisted chiral ring. So what we have here, second, is that we have some basis in the state of vacuum described by the states i. And it's very simple to show that operators O, let's call it O case, are not diagonal in this basis, which means that the O i is not an eigenvector of 
all operators OK. Because if it would be eigenvectors, then you get stuck. User set start acting on it, and you get stuck. The O's don't commute, so right? O's commute. That's what I said. I mean, O C I J is symmetric. Symmetric. I said C I J is symmetric. You were here when I argued why it's symmetric. It's important. But I was meditating. Oh, what you were meditating about? Oh, the important things of the world. More important than this, than I would like to hear. <laughs> Okay, so this is a commutative ring, and the, uh, so we have a basis, and we have this basis and as many commuting operators, <coughs> which is set of O's. Now, classical version of this quantum mechanical statement would be, we have a phase space, which is a replacement of the space of states, and we have Poisson commuting operators, and there are exactly as many as a half of the dimension of a phase space. So classical version of this is called classical integrable system. Classical version is a phase space of some dimension, let's say 2n, and n commuting, Poisson commuting, And let me call now those H, I want to N. So this would be a classical version. But we have a quantum version, and this is quantum integrable system. So this statement that was there, that space of vacuum of supersymmetric gauge so, uh, supersymmetric theories in two dimensions with four supercharges carries representation of commutative associative algebra is the same statement as that the vacua and the operators O's are giving us quantum integrable system. And this is generic actually. And the space of vacuum, let me, one second, yeah, one sec. So space of vacuum now will be, I will write the last definition. is um, completely identified with the cohomology of the operator Q. Yes? What do we then do the analyze of the operator? That's what we will be doing in my lectures. Okay. That's lectures are about this. OK, so there are two. One good news here and one not so good news. The good news is that see, we made very general statement that if you study the space of supersymmetric vacua, you might learn something about quantum integrable systems. But what quantum integrable system you have, I say nothing about it, right? So we somehow have to identify what quantum integrable system it is. Actually, the space of supersymmetric vacua don't have to be, does it have to be finite dimensional? There are many simple examples you can give that this space of supersymmetric vacua can be infinite dimensional, not necessarily finite dimensional. And then the subtlety starts. What, what do you mean by this? But when it's finite dimensional Hilbert space, you're in a very good setup, and you can ask uh, the, uh, the questions of what you just asked me. So in old days, uh, I mentioned here a paper by Chekhozzi and Wafa. What they were this, uh, studying in those old days was um, what's called a vacuum bundle. So let me give you some flavor what vacuum bundle was. And the, I want to formulate the older questions and then show why newer questions are interesting. And uh, newer questions kind of started with a paper uh, Greg Moore, Nikita Nekrasov, and I wrote in mid-90s a few years after the Chekhozzi Wafa paper. So in old days, what they would consider is to take a space of parameters of your um, n equal to d equal to quantum field theory. It comes with some number of parameters. Let's call this space of parameters local coordinates t. And in any point here, this is some point in the space of t's, there is a space of vacuum. 
right? Because space of vacua is uh, in any quantum field theory in two dimensions. It can be when you vary parameters, the space can change. So you vary the parameter. And now think about this as a vector space. And you have some parallel transport. You are moving along the base. So this entire total space, they called uh, the vacuum bundle, which comes with some connection. Let's call it nabla. In local coordinates, this is, a, uh, I since I denoted this by ti. And what Chekhotsky and Waffa showed that um, this connection, if deformed by when you take a state here, you connect on that state, as I said, by OI and create another state in a vacuum. So you can actually combine with arbitrary coefficient, actually. This connection that you had in, this, in, this, in the bundle plus some coefficient times the action of the operator OI, this called this connection nabla twilda, and they showed that the, it is flat. So they would study, in a sense, uh, many things uh, about these flat connections in the space of vacuum bundles. For example, they could have studied some equations like this in a total space. Okay. The flatness condition they call TT star equation because it's flat as there is a conjugate one and the commutator of this with conjugate is zero. And the conjugate one would be di differentiation in a complex conjugate parameters and so on. And then there is entire business of uh, studying the topological quantum field theories. Uh, and the, my lectures will not be about this, although if there is some interest, um, I can uh, connect my lectures to, to this stuff, especially in December there was paper by uh, Nitzke, Cecotti, and uh, Wafa, or Gaiotto, Nitzke, Nitzke, right? Nitzke, Cecotti, and Wafa, where uh, uh, in the language of the vacuum bundle and TT star equation, they reinterpreted the things that they will be the main part of my lecture. So in principle, I might get back to this, explaining how these guys relate this one stuff to another. Okay, now one important question that uh, everybody who works in uh, quantum integrability asks, there was this assumption that there is unique state in the space of vacuum from which we start to construct by acting the operators. If we don't have this unique state, we cannot really have operator state correspondence the way I described. For example, if this is not one state but million degenerate state and so on, we are kind of in trouble in this identification. But there, there, the Chakotsky and Wafa gave two arguments. One argument was if the theory is super conformal, if this theory comes from super conformal, which means not only this algebra, but the, this is super Poincare algebra, so you have to write super conformal algebra. Then there is something called U1 current. In n equals 2 super conformal algebra, again, this is not part of my talk, but I need the argument. In n equals 2 super conformal algebra, there is a U1 current, and as such, there is a spectral flow. And spectral flow is a relation between Neville Schwartz and Ramon sector. This theory is supersymmetric. And there are these words for someone who did not study the subject. Uh, Neville, Schwartz, and Ramon means that you have fermions in this theory. And if you have fermions, you can ask questions, what kind of boundary conditions you put I'm on a cylinder? What kind of boundary condition you put on the fermions? And you can put periodic or antiperiodic. So if you put antiperiodic boundary conditions, we are talking about Neville, Schwartz sector. And if you put periodic boundary conditions, you are talking about Ramon sector. These vacuum I'm describing are in Ramon sector. This vector 0 is in the Ramon sector because I put periodic boundary conditions on fermions. I ha I hidden it somewhere here, but see if you look on the arguments, it's there. So if you want this state to be unique, and if you are in a super conformal setup, then it's an extremely simple argument. What you do, you take neville schwartz sector, and it corresponds to antiperiodic boundary condition, and there is unique vacuum there. 
in the real smart sector, because of unpredictable, <coughs> there is a unique vacuum. And then you have E1 current, which relates any state in the view Schwartz sector to um, any state in the Ramon sector by what's called spectral flow. So in order to describe spectral flow, you have to bosonize the U1 current and construct the oper spin operator. And then spin operator allows you to connect any state. Actually, it's smoothly connected. Every state in the view Schwartz sector is smoothly connected to the. Uh, so if this is the view Schwartz sector, this is its vacua and this is Ramon sector, then there is a spectral flow from one to another and gives unique state. It's very important in super algebra that OPEs of a spin operator, spin operator has unique OPEs with any other operator. This is important because you take the state and unique state gives you unique state. If the theory is massive, if it's not super conformal. So this was about super conformal. In super conformal, there is unique state which uh, uh, leads to this zero in Ramon sector and this is the state which comes from spectral flow from this um, minimum. And this actual guy has its own way to describe is that the, if you have super conformal theory, then you have left moving sector and you have a right moving sector. And you have two U1 charges, which are the left moving one and the right moving one. So every state in a vacuum in Ramon sector will be labeled by two numbers. Now, mathematically, this is a statement about that the, you can, uh, uh, you, you are in a complex setup, your vacuum are described kind of in, in, um, in, a, in a language of the uh, co complex geometry, and then you have P, uh, Q forms. It's not only the degree of the form you can count, but you can count the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part of the degree of the form, and that's related that you can calculate. So this guy then is the one which has uh, uh, the difference equal zero. So this is a minimal one. Now, if theory is massive, uh, there is no you want current, there is no super conformal algebra, let me finish the argument. But still there is identification between neville Schwartz and Ramon sector. And it goes like this. You take disk, you have a periodic, anti-periodic boundary condition, you put the op spin operator, it will make it uh, periodic. So spin operator always exists. You can go from the periodic to anti-periodic boundary condition, and this guy identifies every state here with here, and interestingly, it is actually true in n equal 1 theories that uh, um, the, the Kumrun Wafa and I explained in 1994 for n equal 1 theories, which are also uh, related to the um, uh, special geometry manifold. So there is no spectral flow, but there is kind of the spectral jump that for every state in Ramon sector, there is a state in Nebu Schwartz and other way around. So we take this guy, which is a minimal one, and there runs the argument, then there is a correspondence. Yes. So I feel I understood everything except I don't know what these parameters Ti are. Well, we are going there. Now I'm going to write Lagrangians and Hamiltonians. As I said, did you come from the beginning of the lecture? Yes. I said that it will be extremely primitive, which I will be doing extremely elementary. First two minutes. Okay. So I said that it will be extremely elementary. You don't need any knowledge except quantum mechanics. Okay, some quantum field theory, some kind of calculation. Uh, uh, knowledge of calculations of elementary things. So anyway, so the, uh, the I argued now in quantum mechanical language in uh, using fermions with periodic and periodic boundary condition that there is always unique state if there is a four supercharges. And this unique state comes from the vacuum of neville schwartz sector. So I'm using this to use the operator state correspondence. Now I'm in a business to ask the question, why don't I take now these OIs, these operators, which forms a commutative algebra, and find common eigenstates of these operators. So I'm asking the following question. Find common eigenstates of O's. Now, obviously, this statement is kind of, we are in cohomology, so this statement is uh, I mean, if I take functions of the O's, these things they are commuting are also good commuting operators. So I have to introduce some ba basis of the O's. And then in that basis of the O's, and I know how to introduce that, I spent some time arguing on it. Suppose sigma labels the common eigenstates, and the statement is that I will find the energy spectrum 
common eigenvalues and eigenstates of these O's, which is different than the topological quantum field theory stuff asks when it says, take these guys, you have the flat connections, diagonalize Cijk, okay, because it's symmetric and so on, then then calculate correlation functions of the operators O and write generating function of the correlation functions of O's, which will be Z of T, will be correlation function like this, and calculate. So this would be question of topological quantum field theory. I'm asking different question, is to find the common eigenstates. And why I'm asking these questions? Because this statement I made that why have a quantum integrable system, this is a natural question in quantum integrable system, to describe exact spectrum. Later we will find relations, as I said, and there is a paper I wrote with Nekrasov recently which had that. So if there are no other questions, I want to go to action functional, space of fields, Lagrangians, what are the parameters to give some feeling what the theories are. More questions? And I, uh, I do have a question. Yes. So who tells you how to choose the OIs since they all commute? We could, you know, Usual question in quantum. Then the EI sigmas would change. Right. Yeah. Okay. But if I find one set, I can find another set if you give me the change. Sure. Okay. So I have to pick the uh, set and I will be picking it in some clever way. Okay. So if you wish, um, uh, as I, I had here, important things that th these are two type of theories, one which comes from kaluza klein reductions and another which comes with this kind of thing. Now I want to emphasize important difference between these two. These theories don't break Lorentz invariants. So these theories are Lorentz invariant in higher dimension, right? These theories will be Lorentz invariant in lower dimension, but the rotation with epsilon will break the Lorentz invariants in higher dimension because if you take this, uh, sp this piece of R2, your theory is a cylinder times this R2 with epsilon, and the epsilon rotation broke the Lorentz invariant in, in, in the theory. So higher dimension theory will not be Lorentz invariant. Lower dimension theory will be Lorentz invariant. So I will be creating the theories in um, lower dimension, and in this particular case, um, somehow cleverly, the knowledge of some things in higher dimensional theory will, will tell me how to pick the basis in a lower dimensional theory. But this question of the what is the right choice of the basis and so on was uh, probably covered by Vasily's lectures when he was talking about the more complicated four dimensional theories, no? So you just postulated what Ys are, the operators that generate the chiral ring? Postulated. Well, anyways, uh, uh, since in the models here, all the theories here have been discovered before us by people working on quantum integrable system and even sold by the people working on quantum integrable system, so we can use the knowledge from there. The models here, that integrable systems that we get here, they're a little harder and uh, less is known about them, but we, we have some choices. Anyway, so I will erase and then start talking about the uh, Lagrangians and so on. And uh, regretfully, people ignore uh, this piece of the uh, supersymmetric Lagrangians and all these things in two dimensions, and wrongfully, because there is lots of things done by supersymmetric community uh, that is very helpful and relevant. Werner Nam actually um, had a nice comment that he said now he understood uh, integrability better because if it's connected to supersymmetric vacua and he believes he understands supersymmetry so now now it feels like that he understands integrability but not everybody knows supersymmetry as much as Werner Nam so I have to now uh, re uh, these were very general things any theory with four supercharges has these properties what we are interested in are much more refined details Okay, Lagrangians. Yes, please. We have basis vacuum bundle. If Kellett has same dimension as this fiber. Can you please repeat? If 
have guys who work in Bond. Right. Because by the T, you label by the I. And the same right. I you used to label Q, so they have the same dimension. But it's not obvious this from your discussion. Q's here are, there is one Q. O eyes. So the uh, locally, the fibers are uh, described by O eyes. This is the same thing. But you want to do connection, you have. I have to introduce connection, which means that I have to describe how the state changes when I turn on the parameter. Well, the question why the number of T's is the same as the number of O. That's the way I. Okay. So this setup that I had here is more like what's called the tangent bundles. Okay? So it's the base and the fiber are same dimension. Why? I mean, uh, why, why? Well, uh, that's... Uh, okay. Uh, if you have this OIs in some number, you can turn on certain number of parameters in this quantum field theory, parameter space, and for each OI you can turn the one which doesn't break supersymmetry. It means that the space of the supersymmetric theories is labeled by coefficients in front of linear term when you expand in OI. Yeah, but consider kind of maybe translation and invariant. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, Let me answer this again. So if L is a Lagrangian, then L plus Ti OI sum over I is also a supersymmetric Lagrangian. This answers? Yeah. Okay. Max, what do you want? Uh, no, OI has also zero. Oh, no, no. This we will get. I just explained. I, I just explained that you are using same operators, like in a tangent band, like like in the gravity. You are using same operators to deform the theory, and they these operators one define the fiber, and they also deform the theory. So the, on the base we have deformation of supersymmetric theory, and the fibers are the Fox spaces or vacuum spaces in in each parameter. And I'm studying dependence on this. So it's like well, that's one of the reasons, for example, why relation between what um, Chakot and Waffa were doing and what we will be talking here is a little bit... Uh, uh, Kumrun likes to call the TT star equation like generalization of Hitchin equation. But Hitchin equation has different dimension of base and the, uh, and, and the fiber. It's more like a vector bundle. One TT star equation is more like a tangent bundle. Okay, so let me uh, start. I actually prepared this lecture re really for myself also good. It almost follows the books that Nikita Nikrasov and I were writing and it was lost on a Dropbox. <laughs> okay, so in two dimensions, uh, here I will introduce coordinates there. In, I'm in Lorentzian signature, but it doesn't matter. X plus, X minus will be coordinates on a cylinder and then I have theta plus, theta minus, theta plus bar and theta minus bar are anti-commuting variables associated to supercharges. And I will introduce shifted coordinates, y plus minus, which is x plus minus minus i, theta plus minus, theta plus minus bar. And all fields in my quantum field theory will be functions of y. These are called the chiral superfields. Uh, there are special uh, superfields, which are, uh, so these are in a matter sector. Gauge field and its superpartners are described by vector multiplet. Which I explicitly write just now here in two dimensions, actually not, not big deal. So vector multiplet is a superfield where its lowest compon component is given by gauge field, where in two dimensions, so gauge field has two components locally, zero and one, time, time direction and the space direction. There is a, this is normalization. There is a complex color, which I call sigma, bar, sigma, which multiplies theta minus theta plus bar, its complex conjugate, which multiplies theta plus theta minus bar. Then there is um, there are fermions, anti-commuting variables, which I write like two i. These formulas you had to actually we had to Nikita and I we had to look in lots of literature because they don't really spell out very well in books. By now maybe 
these are explicit formulas that people derived when studies the extended supersymmetry in two dimensions. And they are actually important in calculations. So lambda plus and lambda minus are wild spinners. And then there is an auxiliary term, sorry, I have to write here, auxiliary field, which is called H, and it multiplies the highest power of tetas. And this is auxiliary field. Now, long ago, as I said, the chiral multiplets, um, let me describe it here, chiral superfields. I will call x, and they are given by something which is a function of y plus square root of 2 again. Fermions, which are called psi's here, they are functions of y. y is a combination, so this combination is picked so that the uh, covariant derivative will kill the field. Theta minus psi minus y. And there is auxiliary field also for chirals. They are called F. So these are two, diff two types of fields. Gauge field is here. And here are some scalar fields. But as you see also already in, a, in vector multiplets, there is a scalar. And it's complex. This is a, just artifact of the supersymmetry. So these are wild fermions, but we have complex color. So there is an equivalent way of describing <coughs> this guy, which is in terms of what's called twisted chiral multiplet, which is actually a chiral multiplet, like the above one, but a special one. And this guy. Uh, is related, I call it sigma, it's related to vector multiplet, and these are super derivatives, super space derivatives. I don't have to define it. There is a, this is a derivative with respect to theta plus, and this is derivative with respect to theta minus, but it's covariant because of a super space. So claim is that this guy sigma has same information as v, and uh, when we write the Lagrangian. And this is a, it has nice expansion. Its lower component is given by scalar. Now I expand this thing, and then I'm done with this long formula. Um, so now I will replace the vector multiplet that usually people work with, with a twisted chiral multiplet. Uh, and I need that. So I, I want to show, I, I, I'm just showing some little tricks that we, we are using and they are necessary. Look at this one. So we, what we have here, and y tilde I have to define. So there is another one, which is y tilde. y tilde plus minus is x plus minus minus plus i theta plus minus theta plus minus bar. So this is, this is a curvature of the gauge field. There is no gauge field in this formula. Only curvature enters. So this guy, the sigma, knows f mu nu. It's geometrically more correct to describe things in terms of sigma, because the vector potential is too much extra information. This guy is written in terms of the um, uh, physical degrees of freedom. H is an auxiliary field again. So we have f, we have h auxiliary field, lambda and sigma. And if you look at this, you might ask, OK, what's the difference? This auxiliary field is a two-form. F01 is also a two-form. So why don't I just re rename, rename H to be shifted by F? But it's not possible, because F is dA. And as dA, there are consequences. H is arbitrary two-form. F is a curvature of a connection. So it's dA plus A square. So you cannot really, but then we will, I will play some tricks about this definition. So for example, they have monodromies and so on. So it's important that this guy is here. And now Lagrangians. What is y tilde again? Because is it just the opposite sign of y? What, what symbol uh, did you write in front of the i theta? It's a plus now, you mean? 
This is the definition of one. Okay, sorry, sorry, it's a plus, yeah. Right, opposite side. Sorry, why in the vector field you have just one component of the uh, A field? Where is the A0 plus in one? Okay, you are correct. I just forgot to write it. So there is a conjugate term here, which is theta plus theta plus bar times A0 plus A1. Thank you. Okay, so now what is a Lagrangian? Most general Lagrangian of n equals 2 theory in two dimensions. is constructed by first remembering that gauge fields which are in sigma should be in a joint representation. So sigma is in a joint representation of gauge group. Now I introduce a gauge group. I have a gauge group I take a joint representation of gauge group I call sigma. It's a super field, me said. So it depends on a, it's a function on superspace, but it's a special function of superspace which is of the type here. And this is in a joint representation. And matter fields are in some representation R. I call them X. Some representation R, which is direct sum of some multiplicity space times irreducible. And Ri's will be irreducible irreps of G. So once I give the representation, the gauge group I fix, then I give representation, there is still some freedom left because some lots of parts in Lagrangian are now fixed. I am restricted. I gave my, my action is very much fixed now. So where is the freedom? I show where are the freedom and these places are important. So action is an integral over two-dimensional space, which I called x, which is dx plus dx minus. There is something called uh, d term, which is integration over all four thetas. I have four thetas and I have four thetas because I have four q's. Everything is a function on the superspace. This forms a cylinder. And the uh, uh, first one that I want to get in the Lagrangian is f mu nu square. I want to get this guy square because it's an young mill theory. So how do I get f mu nu square? Is that I integrate over four thetas sigma times sigma bar. I have two thetas here. I will get two when I multiply by conjugate. All of them will be independent. So I will have this times uh, itself. And there will be some other terms. So four thetas eat up square of this, and correct square. The bar will be theta minus theta plus bar. And this term will have f mu nu square. So here is f mu nu square. Plus super things, good. Another term I can write, trace is in a joint representation. So let me make trace in a joint representation like this. Plus, now, let me pick up any function. Complex, uh, well, let's say, something which later will become Keller potential. So let's call it Keller potential. K. Now, it depends on z and z bar. So instead of z, I put x, which is a um, matter field. Instead of z bar, I put x bar. And now, since it's coupled with a gauge field, I have to write how um, matter fields are coupled to gauge fields, and the correct way is to multiply by exponential of v over 2, where v is a vector supermultiplet, this one. And you see, I cannot write that term using only sigma, because sigma contains f mu nu, does it contain a? But the v contains a. So in, in order to write the interaction of the matter fields with a um, with gauge fields, I have to go actually to vector multiple. And this, is, uh, this will be supersymmetric for any k. Now, this is not all. So this was written in terms of the four integrations of theta. So I have to eat up in the Bereziannian integral four thetas. But there are two other terms possible to write, which includes integration over holomorphic part only in a superspace over only two thetas. And the way I introduce everything, there are two possibilities. And these two possibilities, of course, are connected to existence of QA and QB, 
these two different twists that I, I wrote there, or also to mirror symmetry. So plus integral over d2x, and now two integrations over theta, I will write theta plus theta minus. So holomorphic coordinates I denoted here, theta plus and theta minus. Anti-holomorphic ones will be conjugated. So there is such integration, and I can integrate arbitrary function of x like this, and it will be supersymmetric, plus complex conjugate, because this is a holomorphic function of x, does it depend on x bar, so this Lagrangian will be complex unless I add complex conjugate here. And this is called an f term, that was a d term, this is called an f term. And now you can probably realize that equally I could have chosen different combination of thetas to be my holomorphic variables, like theta plus and theta minus bar. So I can keep this one. Everything else will be related. So let's write the other integral, d theta plus d theta minus bar. And now we have freedom here to write any function, holomorphic function of sigma. And again, plus complex conjugate. And all the parameters that Jörg Froelich wanted from me are here. Arbitrary fu holomorphic function W of x, arbitrary holomorphic function W tilde of sigma, arbitrary Keller potential k, and the, the first term for gauge will this fix because we want to get f mu nu square. Where is the 1 over g square? In f mu nu square. It's in, well... It's not f, it's... All these guys are with arbitrary coefficients. So if you wish, with arbitrary coefficients, yeah. Sorry. I just wrote a structure. There is nothing else you can write. Okay? Most general Lagrange. Now, we have to play with it. And our job is to use the general knowledge we have and see how much we can run the Wilson normalization group and things like that. How much we can say about the structure of this theory when we uh, change the energy scale. Okay? But what we know, that if its supersymmetry is not broken, it always will have that form. Only difference will be, this function will change, this function will change, this function will change, and the trace sigma sigma bar also will change uh, with something else which is a function of it. But we have this freedom of the functions. And this is a big power, allows us to say lots of things. So let me uh, introduce uh, f f two, two other symmetries here, and then we can make a break, and then, then I continue with the solution. If I am too slow, please tell me, and I will speed up. If I am too fast, also tell me. W your guy, I am too fast for you? I am too slow, Vasya, what do you think? Normal? Good? Okay, so then I will introduce what's called the flavor group, because this is a quantum field theory. There are lots of global symmetries. I described only local symmetry. The G was a, lo a local uh, gauge symmetry. Now, what kind of global symmetries we can have? First of all, obviously, the global symmetry we can have is already on the blackboard, because in a multiplicity space, when we expand the arbitrary representation in terms of the irreducible representations, we have entire space mi for each irreducible representation, and we can have unitary group acting there, which is, can be a global group. So maximal global group, G global maximal, is a product of U mi's. Right? That's the flavor group. We just think about x's as quarks, Right? They come a lot of them. They are, they are, for each quark, uh, there are m of them, mi. If i labels a given quark, there are mi of them, and we can have rotation group mixing them. And this is unitary group umi. This can be a maximal one. But of course, of course, this is broken. There is a subgroup of G maximal, which is actually global group, and it can be broken by this function. This function doesn't have to be invariant under this rotation. This is a holomorphic function. So we have holomorphic function which should be invariant under unitary rotation, not necessarily. I just have to figure out. 
So trick will be that then there are other representations. We will start mixing the representation. So we have to find real global symmetry group, and this will be important. Another thing is that see, everybody had to ask me who have taken quantum field theory course, because there is something important if G has U1 factor. I did not say that G was a simple group or a semi-simple group or something. G, gauge group, can have some U1 factors. And if there are U1 factors, we can define magnetic charges. We can take... Yeah, yeah sorry, first some question. If you assume that X form vector space, yeah? But yeah. It, it looks as form of manifold. We have this group acting with some manifold, Kelvin manifold. And what is, does it mean represent? Okay, this is a linear space. Okay, let me explain. So, um, the axis will be linear coordinates, right? So the, those non-trivial spaces here, this is called gauge linear sigma module. So the, those other things are related. This is invariant under G. So I have to divide space where X lives by the action of gauge group. And I will get something complicated. So for example, take... You, know, you can assume that X is already run through some non-linear space because... You can assume it's from the beginning. It, you can assume it's from the beginning. Best way to describe it, take a linear space and take the action of the gauge group on that linear space. So you have a factor and you're living on the factors. Already those subclasses of all theories lead to very non-trivial statements and we will see that. You can start saying that the x is the coordinate, x is the coordinate in some Calabria or whatever. Whatever manifold, then we don't whatever. speak about the group. The group act, act somewhere. Or okay, so let's then uh, say this way. These are the two-dimensional two-dimensional gauged linear sigma models. So these are two-dimensional theories, which are gauge theories, okay, and have a Higgs branch. So the sector where the gauge field is, we will call a Coulomb branch. So fields uh, A, sigma, and lambda, uh, psi, sorry, uh, no, lambda, we will call Coulomb branch, and the everything where these guys live, we call a Higgs branch. So if this Higgs branch and Coulomb branch are interacting, you can describe theory by integrating out gauge fields. So you are now living in a factor of the space where X lives under the action of the gauge group. Or if the uh, uh, Higgs branch is massive, you can integrate out these massive guys and have infinite expansion of something on a Coulomb branch. Both effective actions are impossible to calculate. So we will have to figure out something clever way of dealing with that. But I want you to introduce two important parameters which will play the role, which will be part of the parameters on the base in the vacuum bundle, and then we make a break. So if gauge group G has a U1 factor, for example, if gauge group G is a U1 itself or product of U1s, you can introduce, as you know very well, something called a theta term in gauge theory, which is some theta times integral over your two-dimensional surface trace of the curvature f, okay, topological term. And if you have many U1 factors, you can introduce many of them if A labels the U1 factors. 1 to R, whatever R is. But this is not good enough for us because this theory has to be supersymmetric with four supercharges. And turns out that this has a natural supersymmetric generalization and is described by uh, that these kind of terms are included here. And let me single them out. They are included here. So what we do, we introduce another background twisted superfield sigma tilde. And sigma tilde, this is a simple way to write the term. Sigma tilde will be, will start, this guy will be theta plus ir. And we introduce many of them, as many as we have U1 factors. So this is written instead of that term, plus whatever. And then there is a term in a twisted, uh, one particular term, I call it W0 or WT, let me call, which is equal integral D2x, D theta plus, D theta minus of sigma A trace sigma and I put here tilde. Now, if we, way it's written, that it said sigma A, which is a abelian one, 
will have this guy. And then I take trace of this, which gives me f. And there will be bosonic term here, which will look exactly like this. But what I wrote is supersymmetric, because I wrote in terms of superfields. Everything written in terms of superfields is supersymmetric. So this will be called theta term or complexified theta term, which is uh, uh, this has a name. The R is called just to remember for future. It's called the Fileopoulos parameter. So complexify theta term, T is the sum of theta plus I R, where R is Fileopoulos parameter. So now we introduce, we singled out the theta term, complexified supersymmetric theta term in W of sigma. Another question you can ask, how do I make the guys massive? Can I make X's massive? An answer is yes. That term, the mass term, is also included here, and it's written in this one. Let me single it out, because it's a tricky thing that in n equal to supersymmetric theories, uh, the masses are complex numbers. So how can they be complex numbers? It's very easy that the masses of fields x are complex numbers and not real numbers. They are called twisted masses. And they are possible to write for any global symmetry uh, generator, for any global symmetry generator, you can write the mass for the field x. And how does it look like? You need a global symmetry to write these masses. They are already written in the Keller potential there, but I will single them out. You take trace in representation R of following thing. Take x plus sum i. This is a Hermitian conjugate of the superfield x. Exponential of vi twilda, I call it tensor identity in representation ri times x. So what I did, I had this representation where everything lived. I took identity in the reducible component, and I did some superfit will twilda in this component. So if I have a global symmetry, which is unitary group, act, uh, subgroup of umi, for that one, I introduced the field vi, and vi as a vector multiplet itself, can start with some coefficients mi twilda, theta plus theta minus bar. So the vector multiplet was starting as the lowest component was this. And these numbers now are arbitrary. Okay? But in order to write this, I need the global group to be preserved. For every global group, I, I take exponential of vi here, and I get a mass. And these are complex masses. They are called m twildas, are called twisted masses. And why I call it, why people call it masses, is that because when you expand it in the superfield, go to the regular fields, this will be quadratic term in x's. It will be x dagger times x with some coefficient. So those will call masses. So I showed that this is a general Lagrangian. The general Lagrangian contains possibility to make x massive. General Lagrangian contains possibility to have these uh, theta terms that which count the monopole charge, uh, the, uh, the uh, First chain classes uh, of our G, G bundle, if it has a U1 factor, it has first chain classes. Uh, and the, everything is on the blackboard. Now, when I come back, I have to construct that quantum integrable system that I was saying that for any theory there is a quantum integrable system. I have to describe that quantum integrable system and describe the bundle, vacuum bundle, which with parameters which are in W, W twilda, and K. OK, shall we have 10 minute break or something? Sorry, I have a small question. Yeah. Uh, why can't you have a twisted chiral matter field as well? We can. But you said it's the most general Lagrangian. Yeah, uh, where, where is it? The twisted uh, multiple, uh, all multiplets are particular case of chiral. So chi chiral multiplet is just a multiplet which says that it's a function of these variables y. Not all arbitrary ones, but variables y. And then I specialize. There is a vector one and twisted one and so on. What I say that if you take yesterday, by the way, I was asked the same question in a call normal. If I say that sigma is dd bar 
of V. And if I say that in V, whatever is tending in the lower component I call the gauge field, then sigma will be function of the gauge field. right? I don't want to have many gauge fields in the chiral sector. So what I say is that I single out tho those which are called gauge fields, and rest of them I call the uh, whatever. And you can put on x any restriction you want. You can put x to be a vector multiplet in principle. But I'm not considering that. It's no, but I think x was a function of theta plus theta minus, right? And the right. principle should be a function of theta plus theta minus bar. Well, you see. What I call twisted Kyle multiplet is this. And this multiplet comes in a joint representation once, because I want to have a one gauge field. If I break this relation and I take sigma to be Kyle, then it's, it's, in, it's in x already. I, I allow those in x, but I don't allow gauge fields to be in x. Again, this relation makes sigma components expressed to in terms of v components. In v, I define the gauge. Yeah, I understand. But I mean, uh, you have a different su twisted superpotential for sigma, right? So how come all the rest is an x it should be? It's any function of sigma is allowed. I, I'm sorry, I don't, maybe we'll discuss it after, but you, you can look. There, there is a specific one, which I called the sigma. And in that one, I am allowed to put any function, any holomorphic. By the way, mirror symmetry replaces x by sigma. OK, so now I want to continue in um, uh, mentality of the uh, Wilson renormalization group and ask the question that if I make all matter fields to be massive, this is called the theory with a mass gap. So I consider theory with a mass gap. all r are massive, then what I can do, I can, in pass integral, and this is now general argument, which can be, which, which is made mathematically precise in a little bit of the time, in a physical description, I can integrate out all massive fields. Well, massive fields came in the action with something like x dagger x. So they have a Gaussian term, and they're massive. So I integrate them out, and what do I get? I get this action back, but this will disappear because I integrate out all of them. This will change, right? This term was distinguished that it had no derivatives. This will change. Let's call it effective. Sorry, what I am saying? This will disappear. I integrate out x. This will change. will have form very similar to what was written here, and uh, uh, will have other higher powers and so on, many derivatives. So what we end up, we end up with a Lagrangian of this one that needs to be calculated, and this one. It's the formation of this one. So if we now, yes? our derivatives will be in, in here. This will change. This will not be like that. There will be some Lagrangian, which will be k of sigma sigma bar with some unknown function, okay, which has to be calculated. So what I'm emphasizing here, that this procedure of integrated out massive fields go with derivatives in space divide by mass expansion. Okay, they, they are. And, uh, Structural Lagrangian still will be integral over d2x d4 theta of something which depends on sigma sigma twilda, sigma bar, plus integral of d2x d theta plus d theta minus bar of something which I call w effective twilda of sigma. Because there are no other fields. X's are gone. What I'm saying is that some magically some god calls you 
and tells you this is an exact integral, uh, whatever it will be, it has to have this form. One integral over d4 theta and one integral over d2 theta plus d2 minus bar. This is a very important input. Supersymmetry and holomorphy are he heavily used. This term is holomorphic in sigma. We assume that the calculation of quantum corrections do not break the holomorphicity. Okay? And second, we assume that this term can be calculated and in a quadratic part of this term, we have non-degenerate metric. Okay? So this can be expanded as a quadratic part and so on and around it. And, and this, this is all. Why this happens? Because I assumed mass gap. If I assume mass gap, all the non-trivial terms are here, hidden in Kate-Wilda and W effective. Now statement, mathematically justifiable, st I mean, provable statement, or let's say theorem. And uh, some people would consider the theorem. W effective tilde of sigma is exactly calculable and is given by one loop answer only, by one loop only. There are no higher loop corrections. So one loop means determinant. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, is, it, is this function on Lie, complex fight Lie algebra, yeah? Uh, the sigma is in a joint representation of Lie algebra. Sigma is a matrix in a joint representation. Polynomial or might be logarithm. Oh, yeah, okay. I could be. Can be anything. I will now give the exact answer. <laughs> so I'm not saying I'm not saying that it's only calculable. That I will calculate it. So are these theories that have no equivalent divergences? Okay, uh, these theories in two dimensions should be renormalizable. That's all I am asking. Only normalizable one. So what means that the as a quantum field theory, Wilson effective action should have a meaning. Then I'm asking question, what it is? So take quantum field theories, well, Winslow effective action makes me. And ask a question now. So what kind of form it can have on any scale, or even better, in the completely low energy? What kind of form? And I'm saying, if supersymmetry is not broken, just look, if supersymmetry is not broken, only thing I'm left with is one field sigma, which lives in a joint representation of gauge group. So whatever I will write is written in terms of that field sigma and the normalized constants of this and that and all these kind of things, right? So general story told me that I can have term without derivatives, which we call superpotential, twisted effective, twisted superpotential, and we can have kinetic term and higher derivative terms. So I collected kinetic term and all higher derivative terms, which are, I mean, calculable in derivative expansion in effective field theory language, and I say, since these all things can happen, I cannot calculate this. So let's ignore this part for a second. Can I calculate this? Plus complex conjugate here, of course. An answer is, and it has been discovered first in old days by Divecchia, uh, Dada, Salomonson, um, and the collaborators, and Lusher, and it's 1970s for CPN model. So the CPN model would be, I take n copies of complex plane here, n c's, right? And I take the gauge group G to be U1. So I have gauge symmetry of U1, and I have the n, uh, uh, this is uh, c, and these are n of them. So then the uh, Higgs branch will be CPN, theory, and they calculated W effective on a Coulomb branch, not on a Higgs branch, when this procedure calls calculating exact action on a Coulomb branch. Uh, exact answer on Coulomb branch. And um, as I said, it's not doable unless I make all Ri's there, all Ri's massive. If I make all Ri's massive, then this, what I said, makes sense. If I don't make those massive, I can't integrate. Moreover, there will be points in a parameter space when something will go wrong. And something will go wrong exactly in a point 
when uh, the masses of some fields I integrated out actually happen to become zero. So I, I was not allowed to integrate them out, they are massless fields. So this is a philosophy. Now, one important thing is that a uh, bunch of all this stuff can be ignored after I do topological twist. Because after I do topological twist and I consider topological theories, things mathematically are well defined. This is an index, Atia Zinger index calculation, nothing more. In order to get W, you just have to do some index calculation. Even you can go farther saying that, see, let's define W effective of sigma, which is equal to some determinant, and then we can argue whether this comes in a physical theory or not. But this is calculable, and I'm giving now answer for what is the W effective of sigma for general theory. Okay. Now, please keep in mind Buzzer me, buzzer me. I like, I enjoy. Okay. So, in fact, I don't really know what you mean by F. You see, this is a little bit of a mystery. If? F. W. F. Oh, effective. Yeah, yeah, but I mean... Well, I, what I said here was that I had a pass integral. Let's think about the pass integral. And, and I want to do its perturbative expansion, like in quantum field theory. Yeah. And I have some fields in pass integral which are massive. Okay, in perturbation theory, each term I can expand in one over mass. Okay, when mass goes to infinity, these terms will vanish. I mean, this so infinitely massive, heavy guys will decouple. So let's do it now. Every power of one over m will multiply derivative because otherwise I so it will be a derivative expansion. Okay, and I say that there is a notion of a term without derivatives when the power goes to zero, right? That term I can calculate. Okay? That's what, you mean by That's what I mean by W effective. The rest of this stuff I cannot calculate. Moreover, I probably will never be able to calculate. And where is the separation between heavy and light? I introduced the scale. I said that there are masses. So the all X guys, all the guys over there, have a mass. Yeah. Right? Neither of these mass is zero, so I have for each of the guys, I can actually even watch contribution of the first quark, which has mass m. And if it's, I take the lightest one, then I will don't care about anything else but that quark, and so on. Now, what is claimed here is that you ignore all this complicated. When you ask these difficult questions, you're going to direction of something, not discovering something I would discover, not asking those questions, because all these guys that you're asking about are in this scalar potential, in these terms. This one is uniquely defined. This one comes from the original W effective that I had uh, over there, plus corrections. And I will now show you corrections, and you will realize that what I will write, you already know since 1969. Okay? But I will be utilizing it in a, in a question I'm asking. Okay, so let me give you an answer first. So, as I claim, because of this high supersymmetry of n equals 2, all the higher loops will cancel, and this is a good news, right? In this object, in the holomorphic object. And only one loop I have to calculate, and now when I write a formula, I will recognize it. Well, there I will do one more thing, sorry. Uh, the sigma is um, living in a Lie algebra of um, gauge group, right? So. In this Lie algebra is a decomposition of plus, minus, and diagonal component. Okay? So let's take positive root of this Lie algebra. So positive root would mean that I am sitting somewhere, so this is my matrix of sigma, I am sitting somewhere here. I claim that this guy, this sigma, also is massive, is massive, with a mass m mu, where mu is a primitive root related, uh, connected to this one. So if this is in a position i and j, so i here and j here, there is a guy here, i and j, i, i and whatever, j, j, and I have to calculate mass will be sigma i minus sigma j. The mass of this guy will depend on diagonal components of the same matrix. So as long as sigma i, uh, does it equal sigma j, away this point, these guys are also massive. And I can integrate them out also. This is called abelianization. 
same theorem is true about z. It's only one loop exact. Moreover, this part of calculation is extremely trivial, and people have seen it. So now I write W effective, which lives only on Cartan of gauge group, and let's label it. Suppose our gauge group is UN. Now I restrict to gauge group to be UN, just for simplicity. So this is a function of the diagonal components of sigma. And as a superfield, it's super partners. But since um, this is holomorphic, and the superfield capital sigma is completely determined by its bosonic part, which is sigma, I will be using just word W effective of sigma. And I'm giving answer for this formula. And then super supersymmetry, when I replace sigma by superfield, will give me everything. So W effective of sigma twilda equals sum over b 2 pi i tb trace sigma. So this is in case if I had u1 factors in the gauge group. In this particular case, I have only one u1 factor, so this is a one term. In general, if I have many other u1 factors, there will be uh, the term plus trace in representation r, which is a representation over there, of sigma. Now, sigma leaves, uh, the, the, sorry, masses will leave there. Sigma plus m tilde times log sigma plus m tilde minus 1 plus 2 pi i rho times sigma, where scalar product is in Lie algebra, and rho is a half sum of the positive roots. Half sum of positive roots. So this is the final answer for any representation r. And if you want to write in the representation you like, you just plug in that representation there, it's an answer. Now, this calculation actually, in bosonic four-dimensional theory, was first made by Coleman-Weinberg. So this is a Coleman-Weinberg computation of the potential in derivative expansion. That's what I was saying, that Jorg knows that. Okay? What happens with supersymmetry in two dimension? That it's exact. Okay? Then, in a supersymmetry, uh, this was discovered actually in four dimensions by Veneziano and Jankelovic after the work of the Divecchia, Dada, and so on. But we don't care. I mean, these historic parts are important. Uh, I probably should be careful giving credits, but definitely Venezia Ankelovic was after that, the Divecchia, uh, Lu Lusher, uh, Salomonson, and these people. So this is a final answer, and we will be using it in future from now on. Now, what are the vacuo? After I calculate this, can I make any statement about vacuo? By the way, very important. This answer is true in any dimensions. If I was in four dimensions on T2, on torus, this trace R is an infinite sum now, right? Because R is infinite dimensional representation. This is written for any representation. So for example, if the theory in two dimensions came from C dimension on a circle, I have Kaluza-Klein modes for any mode, which means that the sigma has to be shifted by Kaluza-Klein mode n, and I have to have sum over there over n in that formula. And that will make out of that formula uh, uh, classical dialogarithm. Because if I write sigma plus n log sigma plus n, I get Li2. Okay, so the, if, you, if I'm in a four dimension, this trace will contain infinite repetition of the Kaluza Klein modes with weights. And I will get some other answer. So this formula has all the answers for the Kaluza Klein compactification. For the uh, omega background, I have to do some work. And that's why I'm giving lectures, because otherwise it would be not interesting. So I explained the meaning. Now conclusion, after having this. So are you assuming the mass of the Kaluza Klein modes is kept? You integrate out the other mass only? Uh, no, the, you see, Kaluza, OK, it's very good. Very good, thank you. Uh, I said that for every global group, ev every Cartan element of the global group, I can introduce mass. Right? I need global group to write the x squared term. So we are uh, shift in a third dimension, which is a Kaluza-Klein, is a global group. It's just affine. 
it's an affine shift. So n divided by r, mass of the Kaluza Klein mode, is a charge, is a, is a twisted mass for the affine shifts. So it's already included. If I say that the Kaluza Klein modes are included here, Kaluza Klein masses will be complex masses, part of the complex masses for global group, which is the affine one, and I will integrate them out also because they have masses as long as n is not equal to zero. If Kaluza Klein mode is equal to zero, this is my theory in two dimensions, right? So I integrate them out also. And integrate them out would mean that I have to sum contributions of Kaluza Klein modes. And how do I sum it? So there will be a scalar component, the mass, you see I have here formal exits. Now this m tilde suddenly becomes some complex number plus n divided by r. For every m, there is its Kaluza Klein tower, which is that m plus n divided by r. And I have to sum this over n. This is infinite sum, which is summed up to the uh, die logarithm. So if I have four dimensional theory on two torus, I have to do the same thing for z. There will be double sum now, n plus n prime. Uh, will come n plus tau n prime, and I have to take double sum, and I will get the formula. So what I'm saying is that the, as long as my four-dimensional theory is written as two-dimensional theory with infinitely many fields, those infinitely many fields are packaged in this representation with some m's, and I take this r to be arbitrary, my formula over there gives the answer. That's final answer. Of course, when you remember that these m's now are so many and come to color, this becomes very hard on those long formula. In four dimensions or two torus, this is very long formula, but, but it's doable. Let me say now a few words uh, what I can use it for, because Jörg wanted from me that I had to give meaning of what is this Lagrangian is, and this is very complicated. I mean, Steven Weinberg in four dimensions spends lots of time of writing the effective actions and pi mesons and so on. And I said, all this difficulty I just put aside, I assume that the guy upstairs knows how to settle those things, and I'm interested only in this term. Now I make claim, knowing this term, I know supersymmetric vacuum. Okay? This defines a supersymmetric vacuum. And now, beginning of my talk, if we go, I have to introduce these operators, I, I, I have to describe all these things. So let's go there. Differ yes? It has this M mu. It seems it doesn't appear in your old formula. Okay. You have mu associated to sigma i minus sigma j. It is already there. I integrate. These are the masses. So I integrated sigma i j. I integrated sigma i j when i is more than j. The masses of these guys are sigma i minus sigma j. And when I had this log formula, there will be for those guys, there will be instead of m here, sigma i minus sigma j. And then I have to sum over the root system. And that's how I get this is a contribution. I mean, OK, this 2 pi i rho of sigma okay, the, comes from there. The identity, the, it's, it sums up. So identity is like this. It's a simple identity. Uh, I don't have it. Uh, anyway, the, just because it's, they sum to 0, sigma i minus sigma j, when you sum over ij, sum to 0, the logs, set sink times log, can sum up to the, uh, this thing I wrote there, alpha, the um, rho times sigma. So this is effective action of sigma ij's, when I integrate out sigma ij's. It's the answer, final answer. Mm. Oh, sorry, and if sigma i goes to sigma j, then it uh, comes uh, When sigma i goes to sigma j, thing goes bad. Now, so if we first write the answer. We write the vacuum and then take that place, what happens when sigma i goes to sigma j, and study exactly in that place our answer is wrong. What happens? Now, what um, Nikita and I played this kind of game, that uh, we know something might go wrong there, so let's write the answer, watch it, and see what happens in vacuum. And what happens is that the, uh, uh, the vacuum leak. They start leaking, <laughs> like, like in a shower, you know? And you can study all these details, but <laughs> let's not go there. We call it leaking vacuum, and then we discovered that see, in some paper of Witten called Phases of N equal 2 theory, he did not put twisted masses, so he could have found uh, in a large volume limit of Calabiao, which is a very famous example that Witten in that paper described 
large volume limit of Calabiao as in terms of gauge linear sigma model, in that place, for Quintic, for example, you have a global group suddenly coming up. There is a symmetry, it's enhanced symmetry. Once global group comes out, you can put these masses. So the, from Calabiao, you can go to this massive theory and leak to some other branch, which is not included in superconformal theory. But in massive theory, you can leak. And this is connected to, the, to your question, but I want to jump. See, where it's going right now, the speed I'm going right now, is like that I need probably two and a half hour lecture uh, not three times, but maybe ten times. So let me let me <laughs> little bit speed up, okay? <laughs> okay. So uh, how do I calculate from this thing? Uh, uh, how do I count the vacuum? So I'm studying now question of counting the cohomology of this operator Q and what it has to do with the uh, function that I just wrote, W effective of sigma. Okay. Good question. And uh, as I said, CPN model is a one sigma model with a CPN target is one example. Other example is a Grassmannian. When I take um, the different representation, then there is a cotangent bundle to the Grassmannian. There are many, many homogeneous spaces I can write as a, a theory with a linear space divided by gauge symmetry group. But I will give answers for all together. So there are two approaches of describing vacuum knowing this. One approach is physical. So physical approach and topological approach. Now, the topological quantum field theories were introduced uh, long ago. Probably the one of the first one was Albert Schwartz's paper in the early 80s, and then Witten's paper, which made the subject uh, existing. And somehow, so my friend Vadim Kaplonovsky likes to say that when Witten introduced the notion of topological quantum field theory, he did say that, but the people did not fix in their minds that topological quantum field theory is a perfectly physical quantum field theory. It just describes only vacuum sector of the physical theory. So people say, oh, why should I be interested in topological quantum field theory uh, if I'm a physicist? And then you tell them, you know, but the topological quantum field theory are not useless ones. They are describing vacuum structure. Are you interested in vacuum structure or physical theory? They say, yes, of course I'm interested in vacuum structure. But why should I study topological useless theories? And then you have to explain that topological useless theories actually capture the vacuum structure. It's a long discussion. But if we do this the vacua, physical or topological language both works because topological theory is the same as a vacuum theory. So in a physical theory, I remind you that we had this curvature of the gauge field F01. In, I am again in the language of uh, uh, Minkowski space, but now I jump into the or arbitrary Riemann surface and I replace this by statement that the curvature over any two cycle trace F, I called it A in the component A, 1 over 2 pi i is quantized. These are called magnetic charges. So in path integral, I am not only integrating over the gauge fields, and in two dimensions there are no gauge degrees of freedom because gauge field uh, has two degrees of freedom minus two, which is because of symmetry, it's a zero degree of freedom. So basically in two dimensions, you're left no with nothing but such the fluxes. So these are the only degrees of freedom. Now, we had lots of other matter fields and so on we have to take into account. But this is very important condition. So in pass integral, we have a sum We have sum over m. We have to remember this. Now, this is a little bit difficult to work with pass integral like that. So what I will do, and this was invented by many people probably, but what I'm using is from some old work of mine with Andrei Losev and Nikita Nekrasov is that let's promote F into independent two form. Now what that means that what we have to do, we have to add to the Lagrangian following term. Sum i equals one to r where r is a number of these U1 factors, 
ni integral of sigma of fi, trace of fi. Now what happens with this is that if I am integrating, see this sum over n now, the impasse integral, sum over n. will create, this will be the sum, another sum, this is probably what Poisson resummation formula is of, delta functions of trace integral of trace fi's equal integer, right? Because this sum of exponents of ni times this and this and so on has non-zero contribution only if trace integral of trace of fi is an integer. But putting trace of fi equals integer is exactly what I did here. So these two things are equivalent either things that you restrict trace f to magnetic charge m and calculate the pass integral or insert in pass integral the sum over n's and this is a version of the Poisson resummation. Okay? So I will insert it like here and after that I can forget about that condition because it's automatically is, is uh, Now what it does here when I calculate W effective, it changes W effective by adding the extra term from there, because f is in the same supermultiplet as sigma. Sigma was the lowest component of the supermultiplet. f was the highest component of the supermultiplet. It means that see, I have to add the linear term in my superpotential, which is 2 pi square root of minus 1 times sum from a equal 1 to r ni sigma i is n a sigma a. See, it is some simple thing. Moment I add that term there, and I have to sum over n's now, I know exact answer for superpotential, and I can assume that f now is not restricted to this condition. And after that, I can now minimize my superpotential, because now there is no restriction on fields. Before there was Superpotential with restriction on the field satisfying this. Now there is no restrictions on the field. I just have to minimize superpotential, and that's what I will do. This is a physical thing, and now I give you answer what happens when you construct uh, out of superpotential a potential. So potential now comes after you eliminate auxiliary fields. Potential is labeled with n because I have a potential in every, for every fixed n, I have a potential, and it is equal. One half gij bar minus 2 pi square root of minus 1 ni plus dw effective twilda d sigma i times 2 pi square root of minus 1 ni bar and j bar plus dw effective bar, this is from complex conjugate, d sigma bar j and sum over i and j, where I don't know what is gij bar, this guy I would know only if I would calculate kinetic energy here. But I have not calculated, I don't know what it is. But I assume that there is some. And then there is an answer from which I conclude that in every super selection sector, given by this set of n's, which is here, the vacuum equation is this equals zero, because this is the absolute value square of some holomorphic function. Actually, this is even clear. This term here, if I would include in W effective, if I would write this new W effective, then what's written there is new W effective prime moduli square. Right? And this has a minimum when it's zero. And that zero condition now, if I remember this, uh, that W prime is not the same as W, this condition now is 1 over 2 pi i, 1 over 2 pi square root of minus 1, dw twilled effective d sigma i equals ni.
So for every integer n, n integer set, so I take Cartanov gauge group, I put in the diagonal in Cartanov gauge group integer numbers, I order them, I have ordered set of integer number, I have this element. And for each element like that, there is a vacuum such that sigma solves this equation. So vacua are enumerated by number of this set of integers. And the sigmas that I used to describe uh, the effective theory solve the equation. Can you then uh, comment what is trace over R then if sigmas are numbers? So the sigma related in given representation. Okay. So. Sigma is in a joint representation. Trace here in R is about these M's here. Okay. So wh what you have to do, uh, well, let me give example. Let me give example. This is a way, mathematical way of writing trace in some representation if you know something in a joint representation. How to rewrite the matrix from the joint representation to any representation. For example, if you have a matrix in a fundamental representation, spin one half, right? What is the uh, spin three representation? You have to take product, one half times one half times, it's a symmetric power, six symmetric power or whatever, of spin one half representation, right? You calculate that. And then now you are in that representation, and you take trace in that representation. So you have to... Re okay, this sigma lives in a joint representation. This guy, masses, live not even in a representation, right? They live somewhere else, in the global group. So this is a direct sum of a joint representation plus something rewritten in representation R, and then taken trace. So when I will calculate the right explicit formula, you will see it. So that's technical. This is a just simple way of writing. The entire representation theory is about that. So if you have spin 1 half, how to construct spin 5? You just multiply many times, construct spin 5, and then take a trace. OK, I will give examples. It strikes me as a little strange. You say sigma is somewhere in an arch representation, but m is somewhere in the joint representation. But then what do you mean by the sum of the two? Is the sum of the two? Let me write this stupid thing for the UN, okay? Let me write for UN this thing. This is sum. No, it's, it's a correct language. That's how they write it. Sum over i and j, sigma i minus sigma j times log of sigma i minus sigma j plus m minus 1, and i not equal j. That's what is written there. So let's stop the discussion. OK. Okay, I want to rewrite now this equation in a simpler form to just give a variant way of writing everything, and then I move to topological language. So, why is it there any sum over the n? You should exponentiate well, for, sum over the n. Eh? Right, right. For every n, I have this vacuum, and my field theory has a disconnected target. So, n gives me super selection sector for each super set like that. So the answer is sum over n, and I will write those things now, just stay with me. This I fixed n, okay? And I described vacuum in that. Then I have to take all sets of n's, and for each n, as I wrote here, you see, it's a disconnected target space. In each set there is a potential. I minimize potential for fixed n, and then I have to vary the n. That's what it is. But now I will eliminate n, don't worry. OK, so let's take this formula and take exponent of the both sides. I get exponential of dw effective d sigma i equals 1. So I eliminated the n. All the n's are hidden. All solution of this are good. So I multiply 2 pi i, take exponent, and this has all va this describes all vacuum. So I will, when I will do the examples, you will, you will be a little happier, I hope. OK, now uh, I derive this equation, and I want to move the topological language, which is extremely, uh, extremely valuable, actually. What is the topological field theory language for this business? This is how it was actually discovered first. The first example was. Um, discovered in the paper of Moore, Nekrasov, and myself in mid-90s, which was example, 
which later turned out to be nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So we discovered the quantum field theory, supersymmetric quantum field theory for which the vacuum sector was given by nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this was uh, first one and then we for some reason stopped thinking about that and then 10 years later Gerasimov and myself got back to this subject and it developed and worked with Nekrasov when we studied uh, almost everything possible and then with Vasily Pestun we studied even more things which are impossible and so uh, let me give a topological language. So now in topological language what will I will do is like this. I had this sigma which was superfield and it had gauge field fermion actually psi psi, psi minus and uh, sigma and sigma bar. Okay these were the fields in uh, super field sigma. So I topological theory changes the way I think about those guys. So psi psi plus psi minus will be replaced by um, lambda, which is now one form, they were spinners. Lambda, which is a one form, and eta and chi, which are scalars. If you count how many of these guys are, they're exactly as many as I just wrote, because the one form in two dimensions has two components, and there are two others, have four components, and this was four components, two for psi plus and two for psi minus. This is the same thing. Now, what you, the way it's done is that you take R symmetry, R symmetry. I don't want now to explain what R symmetry is, but there is a U1 for R symmetry, and change in a Dirac operator, spin connection which couples it to the metric and tells you what are the spins of these guys, change it by adding the current, the connection from that R symmetry U1. And that will change the, the, the things. And the claim is that for a twisted superfield, sigma, it's actually easy. The same guys, you just relabel them in terms of representation theory. Just this is a one form instead of psi plus psi minus eta and chi. This guy stays the same, it is a scalar. Okay, that's what you achieve. Now, what about the twist? So, this is a regular twist for the twist uh, super multiplet sigma. What about chiral multiplets? What about matter sectors? And here, as a lot of things happens. Now, <coughs> We have huge ambiguity because, as I told you, I used R symmetry U1 to change the spins of these guys and transform it to eliminate spinners and I have only one forms and scalars. But once I go to the mm, matter sector, my global group has a bunch of U1s, right? I mean, this global group is a product of UMIs, there are lots of U1s. I can take any subgroup of U1 and change the spin connection coupling uh, to uh, matter fields. So when I write covariant derivative acting on matter field, I will twist using the U1 from, from the global group. And there are lots of possibilities. So twist in a matter center is ambiguous. There are, in two dimensions, there are many, many twists. Okay? So what is uh, the principle that will allow to have, after the twist, one of the supercharges, Q, to be scalar? Because I want that after I twist this theory, the one of supercharges to be scalar is the one that squares to zero. This is the one I called A before. Uh, and turns out that this principle is following. Anything you do is allowed. Anything is allowed. Anything I mean, any twist of the spin connection plus a U1 uh, coming from any combination of U1s coming from global group is allowed with any coefficients here as long as W of X, which is very important, there is a W of X in the original theory, becomes, after you do this, one zero form on a watch on, on, the, on sigma. So any twist which will lead to one zero form is good. I will give you an example. Just, just to make sure that we understand something. And this is the main example that we will be working from now on. 
So how do I change spin of the fields? How do I do the twist of the uh, spin connection with this linear combination to have W of x becoming one form, which is that it's a WZ. It acquires the world sheet index Z. OK, how do I do that? Now, obviously, what I am talking about, if my background metric in two dimensions is flat, what I am doing, I'm doing nothing. I'm not changing anything. I'm just changing its coupling to the background metric. OK. Example. I call it main example. It's not the first example we discovered, but this is the uh, main example. So take representation R to be L fundamental representations of gauge group G, which I take to be UN. Take L anti-fundamental representations and one adjoint. So this is my set of representations. Now I give the masses, I call it M A F, A goes from 1 to L, I call this one M A F bar, A goes 1 to L, and I call this uh, M adjoint. Okay, they are all massive, and W of X I will take such that, yeah, so global group, maximal global group here, G global, maximal, is UL times UL times U1. So you would think that the I can turn on superpotential, which preserves maximal Cartan subgroup of this, which is U1 to the power 2L plus 1. Obviously, generic superpotential will not preserve that. So let me give a superpotential, which is sum over A, B, and S of M, A, B, S, L twilda. Let me call this guy L twilda as a field. This is L. L then they have indices, because there are these indices A and A here. So this I write L twilde A phi to the power 2S A times L B. Now what this is? Phi is in adjoint. Phi in any even power, any integer power will be also in adjoint. So S A's then have to be half integers. And then I have fundamental and anti-fundamental, so this is trace. Is this clear? I have fundamental, adjoint, anti-fundamental. So this is invariant under the global group. And what is a global group now? I claim that this is invariant under u1 to the power 2l plus 1 only if masses are related. In general, it will not be. It will break the completely as gr group. Um, what do I erase now? I have nothing. OK, let me. OK, we forget now about all this stuff. We don't need this anymore, this representation thing. So uh, claim if m a f is equal minus mu a plus i s a u, m a f bar equals mu a plus i s a u and m adjoint equals minus i u then following is a symmetry l a goes to exponential of minus mu a plus i s a u l a l a twilda goes to the conjugate and phi 
goes to exponential of minus i u phi. And now you take these guys, these transformations. Of course, we have here u1 to the power l. We have u1 to the power l here, which is different. And then we have extra u1 here. So we get u1 to the power 2l plus 1. And for those masses, this is invariant. Okay. So now we have the global group, which is huge, u1 to the power 2l plus 1. And we can use uh, the, uh, that to twist the theory. So claim another one is that in this one, we can, for example, do what's called symplectic twist. As I said, there are infinitely many twists you can do, and I will give a general one. And this particular example I need for future, so I keep it on the blackboard. So, <coughs> symplectic twist is like this. Phi, this phi over there, this adjoint guy, becomes one zero form under twi uh, symplectic twist. It's a one zero form, so we call it phi z. L and L twilda become one half minus s comma zero forms. And since s is half integer, it's one half times an integer, then this is integer number, and that's what it is. And then w of x, we can calculate now what it is. So we have one half minus this is one half minus s comma zero form. This will be uh, the form of the type two s zero form, and this will be one half minus s zero form. So what happens? One half plus one half is one minus s minus s is two s. Cancel this one. So this is a one zero form. Now, in general, general, if we use them um, in this particular example, most, most general twists, then this guy is becoming u0 form for any u. These guys will become 1 half minus s times u plus minus t comma 0 differentials. And that total thing will be 1 0 form again. And this is true for any u and t. So in two dimensions, in this particular example, there are two parameter family of twists you can do, such that w will be uh, 1, 0, 4. And now fun starts. OK, so fun starts like this. Once you twist the theory, your Lagrangian, after topological twist, has many, many interesting properties. One important property is that the entire pass integral, entire pass integral, is an integral, is integral only over what's called BPS states, BPS uh, solutions. And now let me say what are BPS solutions in most generality for symplectic twist. They said there are other twists, but I will not do that. So BPS equations are basically what it says that the entire pass integral will have action upstairs, will be Q of something. And I can drop everything which is Q of something. And what will remain will be basically the delta function of the equations I will write now. So what will remain? Fourier exponent of some Lagrange multiplier times equation. And I will write this equation. So entire integral becomes integral over solutions of some PDEs. These are PDEs. Now what are these PDEs? In a symplectic twist for this particular case, or actually probably, no, most general actually, most general. I will now know most general because it can be written in most general, then we'll specify. So we have dz bar, which is a derivative with respect to connection, which I have, because I keep the connection. It was in super, a twisted superfield, times xi, 
or xi are my fields in representation R, equals minus gi i bar dw complex conjugate of x complex w uh, was a holomorphic, so this is complex conjugate of x bar over dx i bar of bar. This is one equation. And another equation is fzz bar of this connection A, so curvature of connection A plus mu of x comma x bar equals zero, where mu mu is a moment map uh, g star valued associated with symplectic form omega, which is sum i j bar g i j bar of x x bar d x i wedge dxj bar. So I have this Keller metric, gij bar, which enters in the equation and defines the g star valued moment map, mu, with the symplectic form ca calculated from the Keller metric, entering in the 1-1 uh, component of the equation. So this now system is invariant under action of the gauge group. So I have to divide by action of the gauge group. And usually, this is usual. In a good situation, this is finite dimensional. This moduli space is finite dimensional, and I have finite dimensional integral. So I started with infinite dimensional integral, I ended up with a finite dimensional integral. Why? Because if I'm interested only of the correlation functions, and this is what topological fields are interested in, correlation functions of Q exact operators, which I called chiral ring generators, then only I care is uh, 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 non-trivial terms in Lagrangian, which are not Q exact. And all the terms that are Q exact, I throw it away, and what is remaining is uh, non, uh, the only, only the uh, integral over the equations, solutions of this equation. And this is very powerful now, because some, some many interesting equations have this form. OK, let's go to our main example and see what are the equations in our main example, even if we will take and drop these guys and keep only a joint. Just let's take our main example over there, make capital L to be 0, and I have only one field phi joint. I can't be more simpler than that. What is this equation for that case? The answer is, this equation in that case has a name, and it's called the Hitchin equation. Let's write what it is. There is no W star, because I throw away, I took the L equals 0. I, I, I throw away this. There is no superpotential W. So this guy is 0. And what is this one? It's obvious what it is. This moment map for that thing is a commutator of phi z with phi z bar. That generates the Lie algebra valued moment map with a symplectic form, d phi wedge d phi bar. So I get equation. Nabla x, x is phi now. Nabla phi equals 0. Obviously, complex conjugate equation, that the phi has an index z. Nabla z phi z bar also is 0. And f z z bar plus commutator of phi equals 0. Let me write it somewhere. Let me write it here. So in the case of L equals 0, the moduli space I have is a moduli space of solutions to the equation nabla z bar a phi z equals 0. These are two complex equations. And another one, f z z bar plus commutator of phi z with phi z bar equals 0. Divide by action of the gauge group, and this is called the Hitchin moduli space. This is hyperkeller manifold. 
and lots of things interesting are. So, by doing what we are doing, by just stupidly calculating this function, we're calculating cohomology of the moduli space to solutions of the Hitchin equation. We're counting, for example, we're calculating volume of the manifolds, which is solution of these equations. Now, these equations are written for arbitrary Riemann surface sigma. So let's now replace our cylinder, as I said, by arbitrary Riemann surface of genus G and uh, N marked points. I had cylinder always, but it's a field theory. I can put it in any manifold. OK. Calculating intersection theory of, um, of this moduli space has been a very old problem. Hitchin wrote this equation in 1987 or something. And this is a reduction of the instant on uh, uh, self-dual Young-Mills equations in four dimensions and so on. And now you probably realize that if I can do this, I can do the intersection theory on moduli space of instantons, blah, blah, blah. So we are now in the right setup. That, but general equations are this. So this is true for any W star. For it's, it's most general. And uh, Nikita and I recently actually even wrote a paper of explicit answer for this theory. OK. What does it mean? And I finish today's lecture by this. What does it mean that what I just said I wrote with Nikita some whatever thing? That means, and the one application of the study of this model I, of the equations is following. There has been a standard law, very standard since I was a baby, that the, well, since I was whatever, a very young man, that the topological theory has a following, uh, in supersymmetric theories are following identities. Take trace of minus one to the fermion number of exponential of minus beta h minus ti oi sum over i, where oi's are chiral ring operators. Now, the argument standard law goes like this. Let's call this z of t. Well, because of for every boson for energy more than 0, there is a, a fermion, these things will contribute with opposite signs, and they will cancel, actually, here. So this reduces only to the trace in the vacuum of physical theory of minus 1 to the f. In the vacuum, h has 0 eigenvalue of exponential of minus ti oi. OK, little simplification we got. But then there was an, a magical step, which is saying that this theory is some finite dimensional quantum mechanics. Topological field theory is some finite dimensional quantum mechanics. What is that finite dimensional space? That finite dimensional space is this space, which is finite dimensional. And then they used to write that this is same as trace of exponential of minus ti hi in some quantum mechanics, where hi's are associated to oi's somehow, and these quantum mechanics we have to invent. So now I'm giving answer explicitly in this language that this actually sometimes is true. And until um, some work that um, whatever uh, I mentioned, Greg, Nikita, and myself in mid-90s, only example was known for such things. The real, cl real clean example was example of two-dimensional young mills, which is empty theory. But leads to many interesting stuff and so on. So I claim now that this identity can be clearly written in the case of this. Okay, and give you the answer, which is from the paper I wrote with Nekrasov about six months ago. Of, uh, of the general case, just quickly jump to the answer, type of answer, which will be the kind of announcement of the next week's lecture, start of next week's lectures, is that Z topological, for any theory of this type, is equal sum over certain space B of H 
to the power g minus 1 of sigma b, exponential of minus sum over i, ti of o i evaluated on sigma b, where b is a space of solutions of exponential of dw effective d sigma i equals 1. This is our equation that we derived for vacuum. And H, it has a name. It is called the handle gluing operator. And is equal exponential of minus certain function which has the meaning of the same as superpotential, but in two dimensions it couples to the metric. So this appears only when you have a metric, when you have a card space in two dimensions. For cylinder, it's not there. Times determinant ij of two derivatives of our superpotential. Times Wandermond of sigma, where delta of sigma is a product of positive roots of alpha comma sigma, which is in the UN, uh, AN case is just sigma i minus sigma j. And that's it. So that's an exact answer of for intersection theory. You plug in any function, symmetric function, on the Cartan of your uh, gauge group, solve this equation for W effective. I had their formula for general case and take h to the power g minus 1 in sum. So this is a sum over all genes. So I finish today, and uh, next week I start with topological theory and introduce algebraic integrable systems. I will consider omega background and calculate same things for omega background with one epsilon. So hopefully next week we will discuss some thermodynamic beta ansatz. Thank you. <laughs>